tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your search is through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found you. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 19. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me tonight. Tonight's feast for the imagination comes from author Saras Nikita, with a particular recipe for body horror that is as sweet as it is savory. So I hope you brought an appetite. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now... Allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies, and nightmares come to life, where those who seek the darkness need look no further. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. And now, without further ado, from author Sarah Snakita, I give you Dad's Famous Preserves. When I was 11 and my brother Rourke was 16, Dad moved us to the jungle to deliver the Lord's good word to the people who lived there. He must have thought it would change us, make us into men lift us above the everyday sins of the other boys littering the stoops of Boston. That's what he called them, everyday sins. Dad said that everyday sins were small things. Small things like not telling the Irish girl who lives in the building across the way that maybe the cat's been sitting in her window, because the way her curtains fall lately they bunch up around the pull string. And if a person were bending down in just the right way, for example, on his knees, whispering prayers before bed, he might see right through the gap to whomever might be standing there, blow-drying her hair, in clean white panties. Everyday sins can sneak up on you, son. Like bees. One or two aren't so bad, but when you get a swarm of them together, you're in big trouble. Dad had black hair and a mouth that could smile all the way to the corners of his eyes. He was not a religious fanatic or a child abuser, if that's what you're thinking. Dad never beat us with Bibles or locked us in closets or forced us to grasp crucifixes heated over burners. He was just an electrician turned preacher who, in addition to being fond of analogies, believed that God would want men and boys to wear heeled shoes and pressed shirts while they were delivering the good news. He'd been flipping a batch of Dad's famous hotcakes while he delivered the analogy about the bees. Dad cooked us hot meals all the time, and everything he made was famous. They'll sting you swollen, son, if you give them a chance. You have to be on the lookout. He put the plate of hotcakes on the table, and we ate them together in the warm kitchen with syrup and butter and cold milk. There were no bees in the jungle. The native women were not like the Irish girl or the lady with the tiny waist on the detergent box. Their breasts fell to their navels like cupfuls of cold molasses sinking slowly down their chests. They were the first breasts I'd ever seen up close. Instead of using a toilet, the villagers squatted over holes and their nails were thick and yellow. They were all missing a toenail or a fingernail, and sometimes more than one. The girls poked pieces of wood and bone through holes in their noses and ears. 
and sometimes lumps of scar tissue bloomed up around the holes like chunks of white lime built up around our drain at home. They squatted next to coal beds while they cooked. Some nights the firelight showed me their down there hair and dark parts beneath that hung like flaps. Some had brown and black tattoos on their faces. Some of their heads were as bald as eggs. The men were strong and glossy and hard. They hunted monkeys and butchered them with their hands. Then they cooked up the meat, and the guts too. They even broke open the bones and dug inside with their thumbs and then ate the stuff that came out. Sometimes they pulled out the guts before the monkey even stopped breathing. The children turned over logs and found white grubs the size of pecans that they roasted on sticks before chewing them up. They watched the moon, and some nights they smeared things on themselves and danced in front of bonfires. One night, I saw a baby born. Inside our chapel was very, very hot. The walls and roof were made of heavy pine planks. The planks were the first things we brought in once the road was cleared, said Father Clausen, showing us how to fan out mosquito nets over our beds and weight them at the bottom. He pointed to the four glass windows looking very proud. From a pair of very charitable Christians in Long Island. Real glass. They let the light of Christ shine right in. He beamed. I doubt there's another set of glass windows for 300 miles in any direction. The windows didn't open. The air in the chapel was as hot and heavy as the steam that used to hiss from Dad's iron. Beads of sap oozed from the pine lumber. Scenting the smother like Christmas time. Everything was sticky. The few villagers curious enough to attend services brought banana leaves to sit on, so they wouldn't get sap on their bottoms from sitting in the pews. They fanned themselves with fronds, and then stopped coming altogether. Dad said sometimes the good word was like the sound of the ocean. Waves just keep crashing on in the background, and finally a day comes when people see that the waters are cool and clear. People wade in and try to swim. Some of those people will take to the water like fish, and others might not get the hang of it right away. Some people might only dip in a toe. He'd always drop his voice for the next part. And some people need us more than anyone else, because by the time they get to the water... They've already been on fire for a long, long time. Dad was from Chicago first, then Minneapolis, and then Boston. He'd signed a year contract for us, and when the review board asked if he'd had any experience living in the tropical wild, he said, I've studied up. To us, he said, If the Swiss family Robinson can do it, so can we. The Lord will watch over us. But not many days had passed before it became clear that neither thing was true. We were dangerously ignorant about the jungle. We packed useless things, a swimsuit, a gold pocket watch, a red plastic radio that never picked up a station and ran out of batteries after the first week. Dad bought three jars of pomade because he was afraid he'd run out. Nonetheless, he assured us everything would be okay. We were on the Lord's mission, and he was looking out for us. Those first months were a dark time. Our water filter was a heavy contraption that took both hands and all my weight to pump it. In the heat of the day, I'd avoid pumping water until I was so thirsty my head throbbed, and then make it worse by exerting myself in the heat. For food, we had a kind of dried porridge with vitamins ground up in it, and you added water to make a sweet, gritty sludge. The best way to get it down was to drink it fast, like cod liver oil. Suffering in button-up shirts and heeled shoes with socks, we doled out litanies to the strange natives who looked at us skeptically, clucking their tongues and shaking their heads. The village children ran naked in the open air, and we waded into the brown running stream to splash their dark bodies with water. I tried not to feel bitter thoughts toward them. On Sundays, Dad offered sacrament, pressing wafers of host into rough brown hands and making the sign of the cross in the air. 
On the night in which he was betrayed, Christ broke bread and said, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The villagers inspected the paperish discs. Taking wary nibbles as if tasting an unfamiliar fruit for the first time without knowing if the flesh would send them into fits or cause chaos in their bowels. Nobody understood a word either side was saying. At night, Rourke and I lay beneath the mosquito nets and felt things crawling on us, scratching furrows in our legs with our grimy fingernails. We'd been itchy and paranoid since the night Rourke had found a millipede as long as his forearm coiled inside his pillowcase. Sometimes we lay in bed and remembered things together, like the icebox back in Boston and the cool fountain in the square. Rory reminded me of Dad's famous potato and fried egg hash with ketchup, and I reminded him of Dad's famous chocolate egg cream always with an extra sprinkle of Ovaltine on top. One very dark night I dreamed of the Irish girl. She was blow-drying her hair. She turned around and I saw that her breasts were deformed and made of scar tissue. Lumps stacked upon lumps like bunches of half-dried grapes. Beneath her white panties something bulged and squirmed. The hard, horny head of a giant millipede emerged from one leg of her panties and wound down the inside of her thigh, circling once before disappearing behind her knee. She held up her thumb, and there was black stuff on it. She sucked it off and smiled, looking right at me, still holding the blow dryer. I'd wet the bed that night for the first time in years. But Rory didn't notice. The sheets were always damp anyway, and we trained our noses not to smell things. Four months passed and Dad was sick. He would stand in the palmettos behind the chapel and make himself vomit before morning service, so he wouldn't have to stop the sermon when he felt it coming. Long, flat worms like ribbons came up in the vomit. Yellow stains bloomed in the armpits of his white shirts, and he had to go to the bathroom a lot. He grew thin and grim. Still, he didn't want to leave. He said that nothing was more transient than flesh, and he felt proud that God believed he was strong enough to be tested. Rory and I wondered about this. We also wondered whether or not God considered all meat to be flesh. Were the worms made of flesh? Were the grubs? The millipede? The monkey guts? Were the villagers? What was the difference between flesh and just regular old meat? We couldn't decide. The infection began with a black dot the size of a pea on the top of Dad's foot. It looked like the time I'd stepped on a sharpened pencil and a smooth pellet of lead had lodged itself in the web of my big toe. At first it only itched. Dad thought it might be a mosquito bite turned blood blister. Maybe he could just coax out a few drops of blood and the thing would turn back into regular skin. He squeezed it between his thumbnails, but nothing came out. When it was bigger the next day, he tried to prick it with the corner of his folding razor. The blade barely brushed the dot when Dad sucked air over his teeth and squeezed his eyes shut. Gripping the sides of his foot with both hands as if curling up that way would make the pain stop. The next day, the dot was twice as big, and it was no longer a dot. It was a little brown crater with a black pit and the ring of skin around the crater was puffy and angry looking. The day after that, the foot was so swollen it bulged out of Dad's shoe like rising bread. And a day after that, the shoe didn't fit at all. For the first time in months, Dad stayed in his bed beneath the mosquito net instead of rising from morning prayer. We tried to cool him by fanning him with fronds the way the villagers did, we pumped the water filter for him and offered him mangoes and porridge. 
He drank some water and ate a little of the mango, but the porridge came right back up. When he could no longer bear the heat in the chapel, he crawled outside to lie on the ground in the shade of the giant palmettos. His hair hung in greasy strings and his forehead was shiny with oil and sweat. The whites of his eyes had begun to look yellowish. He was embarrassed that he'd had to crawl. Two days later, Dad didn't even think about crawling. All day long he lay moaning under the palmettos with the mosquito net draped over him, not caring about the ants that marched across his belly, with a centipede making paths through his hair. He kept one hand pressed into his face, either palm down covering his eyes or palm out with the back of it pressing into his mouth. I think he did that so no more pain sounds would come out. Dad hadn't taken off his sock. He couldn't. The rapid swelling had cinched the seam of elastic tightly around his calf. Flesh bulged above and below the seam, making Dad's lower leg look like a tied sausage. We could have cut the sock off. Despite our ill preparedness in other areas, we managed to bring a pocket knife apiece. Rourke's even had a tiny pair of scissors that folded out, so you could pinch them open and closed with your thumb and forefinger. But Dad wouldn't let us touch his sock. I think he was afraid to see what was happening under there. He didn't want Rory and me to see either, but we knew it was worse than we could imagine because by then, the smell was so bad. Dad's infected leg gave off a smell like fetid cheese and rotten hamburger meat. You could smell it ten feet away. We'd all done a fine job of training our noses to ignore our own smelly underarms and the bouquet of the latrine hole, but no sane person could ever shut out the smell of Dad's infected leg. My brother and I stole sips of air through our mouths and pretended we didn't notice as we sat with Dad distracting him with staged arguments about which of his sermons we remembered best. He distracted us with forced chuckles that doubled him over with pain. Dad's moans became high and shrill at the end. Consumed, none of us ate or slept. Rory and I didn't know what was expected of us and Dad was too sick to say. God was nowhere to be found. After Dad slipped into delirium, he could no longer refuse Rourke's pleas to let him run and fetch Father Clausen. Rory left the chapel early in the morning, disappearing into the spots of brush that had grown over the path since we'd walked at last. He didn't come back until nearly dawn. Father Clausen will be here when the sun comes up. He'll bring some men with a cart and a mule to bring Dad out. I lifted the mosquito net so Rory could climb into bed next to me. What about the doctor? I whispered. There isn't one. Rory groaned softly as he settled into the bed. He sounded very tired. Not a real one. Dad'll have to be flown out the way we came in. Father Clausen already radioed San Tomas for a pilot. Rory was silent for a while. I told Father Clausen about... about the smell... He asked me how long, and I told him almost a week. After another pause, Rory added quietly, He asked me if we have kin in Boston, you, you know, just in, in, in case that... Rory broke off in a heave. I could tell he wanted to cry. At last he said, In case... The Lord takes Dad before we make it out of here. He said that in an even, weighted voice I'd never heard from Rourke before. Dad was right about one thing. The jungle had made a man out of my brother. A Presbyterian doctor in San Tomas cut off Dad's pants with scissors that were bent flat halfway down so they could slide right between Dad's pants and his legs. Then, the doctor used his bent scissors to cut Dad's socks into squares. 
When he began to peel away the squares, Dad tore at his sheets and screamed to God for the strength to stand it until the nurse rushed in with more morphine. Father Clausen stood by his bed and Rory and I held Dad's hands as each square was peeled away. His leg didn't look like a leg anymore. The knee was a black bulge with hard, raised bruises. And the gaps between bruises were mounds of flesh so swollen that the skin over them was stretched white and split into hard, bloodless cracks. Below the knee, the bruises became a forest of brown craters, each with a black pit like the first one we'd seen on the top of Dad's foot, the one he thought might be a mosquito bite. Square by square, the infection only grew more grotesque. Ripe pustules on the calf broke audibly to drip green fluid that filled the room with its cheesy, sickening smell. Around the ankles, thick, white, and yellow stuff pooled between chunks of diseased tissue. The foot was nothing more than a spongy, grayish mass, like a wet biscuit dissolving in mop water. A lot of the squares wouldn't peel off. They were melded to the leg with crumbles of yellow crust, and trying to peel them just caused more flesh to tear away exposing Dad's long, white leg bone. The doctor called the squares of stuck sock grafted and said that it probably happened at the very beginning before Dad's body stopped trying to scab over and heal itself. The doctor gave up trying to remove the remaining squares of sock. Even he looked aghast. I've never seen anything like it, he kept saying. His accent sounded like the man with the hot dog cart back home. I've never seen anything like it. Father Clausen took us into a waiting room and swallowed an aspirin and told us that the grafted squares of sock didn't matter anyway. I'm not a doctor, he said, but if I've ever seen a clear-cut case for amputation... It was lying in front of me ten minutes ago. Father Clausen sank into a chair and looked at my brother and I, thin and filthy, blotchy with heat rash and covered with the scabs of bug bites scratched bloody in the night. I could tell by the way he softened that he pitied us. San Tomas has some of the best doctors in this part of the world, he said. If your father's life is meant to be saved, these men will save it. The priest closed his eyes and I knew he was seeing it again, Dad's rotting leg. I saw it too. It was burned into the dark behind our eyelids. He tightened his hold on the crucifix around his neck. Then he opened his eyes and looked at us sincerely. His voice was as soft as a whisper. Your father should not be alive. God is truly walking with this man. God may have been walking with Dad that day, but Dad himself would never walk again. The doctors found rot running all the way up to his hip, so that's where they amputated. The place where Dad's leg once met his pelvis was now just a concave socket, the size of a baby's head with prickly stitches like long, black caterpillars, holding the skin in place. There was a tube in Dad's arm for morphine and fluids, one in his chest to pump antibiotics in, and another beneath the covers to pump other things out. A long time passed before Dad was conscious enough to speak. Father Clausen made arrangements for us to stay at the convent in San Tomas, where the nuns treated us like children. They did not know the things we had seen. When Dad started to come around, the doctor called Father Clausen and he drove us from the convent to the hospital in his big green Buick. I stood beside Dad's bed so excited I began to cry. Dad opened his eyes then closed them for so long I was afraid he'd drifted off again. 
but at last he broke the seal of scum cementing his lips together, and the first thing he said was, Where is it? Father Clausen looked at us and we both shrugged our shoulders. Dad? Murray sat gently with tears on his cheeks. We're here. Simon and I and Father Clausen. You're going to be all right. Murray's throat caught and he glanced at the lopsided mound of blankets covering Dad's lower body. I, I, I mean, you're going to make it. You're not going to die. Dad didn't say anything for a minute. I squeezed his hand. His head turned on his pillow and he looked at me incredulously. Then you hear me ask you a question, son. I said, Where the fuck is my goddamn leg? Back in the waiting room, the doctor with the accent of the bent scissors spoke to Father Clausen in a rapid, rolling language. Father Clausen looked at the floor with his hands clasped behind his back, nodding. When the doctor was finished, the father turned to us and said, The doctors think that your father's fever has damaged part of his brain. I stammered, stunned and confused, but Rourke was angry. His fists were tight balls at his sides. The problem with our dad was his leg, father, or didn't you see it? Because I did, and my little brother sure did. A fever can't change a person that way. When I had the mumps, I was as hot as a skillet for three days, couldn't bear a stitch of clothing or a spoonful of broth, and I didn't wake up a swearing blasphemer. Father Clausen nodded, still looking at the floor, this time with his hands clasped in front of him. He started to say something, then stopped, as if he changed his mind about what to say. He started again, carefully. Son, every part of a man is controlled by a specific part of his brain. When one part of the brain is damaged, he might forget how to walk. Another part and he forgets how to swallow, or how to speak, or how to read, or, or write, or do arithmetic. These doctors say that sometimes, not very often, but Sometimes, a very special part of the brain gets hurt and the person forgets what kind of person he is. They think that in your dad's case, the fever just... burned that part of him away. Father Clausen put his hand on Rory's shoulder. May God be with you, boys. The church will do everything it can to help you and your father through this... this trial. You must have faith. Rourke clenched his fists more tightly and shrugged out from under Father Clausen's hand. God had his chance, Father, and the church brought us to this Gomorrah to begin with. I don't think we'd like any help from either of you. In fact, I think my brother and I ought to be alone right now. He took me by the arm and began to turn away. Father Clausen's voice called out. This is a time for joining together in prayer, not for casting blame. Rourke did not turn back. There's one more thing, called the priest. Something in his voice made Rory stop. Your father says he won't leave here without his leg. The man in the hospital bed had Dad's face, but nothing else about him was the same. When the nurses came to change his bandages, he waited until they were leaning over him before he tweaked their nipples through their smocks and asked if all the women from their country were sluts on wheels with titties of steel. He held his fork with the wrong hand and laughed at things that weren't funny. They wanted to know where the fuck were his goddamn cigarettes, wide filter Paul Malls, as if he'd smoked them every day of his life. Even his breath smelled different. I know. Because right before we landed in Massachusetts, he grabbed my collar and pulled me close. Those olive-eaten soul bones said they'd never seen the bug I got. He told me. His voice low. He was so close I could feel hot breath in my nostrils. Said maybe it was the first time anyone got it. 
anywhere in the whole world. And I said, isn't that something? Hey, why don't pack the whole thing up and ship it back to the good old US of A? Maybe have the fellas from the Mayo take a look at it. For research, you know. Just so I can make sure I do my part. He smiled a smile that made his face dark. Then I looked at the sawbones with my eyes real big. Big, wide, crocodile eyes. And I say, I want to do my part to see this tragedy don't befall another living soul. Not if I can do anything about it. He laughed Swedish breath into my face and I recoiled. He yanked me fiercely back to him. It belongs to me, after all. It's my goddamn leg. You can't just toss someone's leg in the garbage like a used rubber. So they said, yeah, maybe I had a point. Those brains at the Mayo are thinking up new medicines all the time. Pills to stop your headache, cure the clap. Even pills to make your dick hard. Those guys may have something doing. So the Sawbones trusted up in a big glass tube full of some of the formaldehyde stuff, locked it in with these big steel caps. I saw them loading it into the cargo hold. Looks like the biggest pickled pig's foot you ever saw. He laughed again. There was a rattle and a lurch as the landing gear deployed. We were back in Boston, but it didn't feel like home. Nothing was the same. I'll be fucked if those needle dicks at the Mayo Clinic ever get their hands on it. It's mine. Nat pulled me so close his nose touched the skin on my forehead and his voice fell to a whisper that made my skin break into goose flesh. Do you hear me, son? It's mine. Father Clausen had arranged a one-bedroom apartment for us on a sloppy street beside an Italian restaurant. It was close to St. Elizabeth's, the hospital where Dad could go if he needed to see a doctor. And I mean the other sort of doctor, too, Father Clausen reminded us. A psychiatrist. If he gets any worse, or if you boys are ever afraid he'll hurt you, just pick up the phone and call St. Elizabeth's right away. I've written the number to the psychiatric crisis line right here next to the phone. They also said the church would pay all of Dad's medical bills, so none to worry about that. And there was a Murphy bed in the living room, he told us. Said there would be room for all of us as long as my brother and I shared a bed. He spoke a last hurried blessing, and then he left. The apartment smelled like garlic bread and had nubby carpeting with gold and burgundy curlicues, like carpet from a movie theater lobby. There was something called a kitchenette, which was a half-sized icebox, a sink, and a hot plate on an island of dingy linoleum that curled up where it met the carpet. Father Clausen said he chose this apartment because it had belonged to a man with polio. The door that led in from the alley had a wide ramp and a rail for Dad's wheelchair, and above the bathtub and toilet were special bars where he could grab on if he needed to. The countertops in the kitchen and bathroom were only half as high as normal so he could reach everything. Dad sat in his wheelchair in the kitchenette, smoking palm malls and yelling slurs at the two black porters who had toted our luggage from the airport. We didn't have much, mostly just second-hand clothes and dishes from the nuns in San Tomas. The pair of big men struggled up the wheelchair ramp with something heavy wrapped in black duvetine. They set it down in the corner and were wiping their brows when Dad yelled, You stupid spooks! Are you going to put that right in front of the radiator? He dropped his cigarette in the sink and wheeled angrily across the room. Be careful with that, goddammit! Do you even know what this is? He yanked off the duvetine. Rory and I froze, staring, not believing. It's my goddamn leg! That's what it is! There it was. Dad's rotten leg bobbing inside a glass tube as high as my shoulders. Steel caps closed the tube at the top and bottom, bolted tight with pieces that looked like chrome lug nuts. A paper with a big orange symbol that said biohazard stuck to the glass with strips of wrinkly white tape, 
and a few paragraphs of medical words filled the space beneath the symbol. Beyond that, the gray mess of craters and boils floated like a fleshy jellyfish in the pale yellow preservative. Cost me half my nutsack and a gold pocket watch. Good thing you darkies are hot for bribes and shiny things or it'd be halfway to Alabama by now, on its way to be poked apart by some egghead with a microscope up his ass. One of the black men took a step toward Dad, like he might hit him, but the other man touched his elbow and shook his head. And after that, they both left and closed the door behind them. The lights in our new apartment were dimmed by puddles of dead moths settled in their yellow fixtures. The fluorescent over the kitchenette flickered constantly, like it was sucking its electricity through a bent straw. There was not enough light or space or air. We all stood together in our new home, not speaking. Me, my brother, my dad, and his preserved amputated leg. Rory turned 17 that spring and fibbed himself a year older so he could join the Navy. I tried and begged him not to leave, but he went anyway. He hugged me and told me he'd be back before I knew it, but he couldn't look me in the eye, and we both knew he was abandoning me. He was leaving me alone with Dad. Dad smoked cigarettes all day and watched game shows on TV. The Price is Right was his favorite, he said, because when Bob Barker picked a pretty woman to guess the prices, you could see her tits bouncing as she ran down the stage. Hell, doesn't even have to be a pretty one, he said, lighting a fresh cigarette off the old one. We mostly ate takeout from White Castle and Carl's Jr., but sometimes at the end of the month, before Dad's disability check arrived, I'd use the hot plate to warm up food for us. Mostly frozen things, corn dogs, pizzas, chicken pot pies and flimsy tins made of foil. We'd eat off paper plates sitting at a card table we'd found folded up under Dad's bed. Once, I tried to make beef stroganoff, but when the time came to eat it, I couldn't. I couldn't get past the thick gravy and slippery noodles sliding over bits of meat. After the stroganoff, I had a hard time eating altogether. The feeling of chewed food churning around in my mouth made me sick to my stomach. I lost weight. I took long baths and showers, liking the feeling of scrubbed skin and the closed door between me and Dad. In the afternoons, I sat outside on the wheelchair ramp and pretended to read catalogs. From there, I could see people walking past on the sidewalk, but they couldn't see me. I saw the public school kids walking home from the bus stop, and housewives on their way back from the baker and the butcher. Once, I thought I saw the Irish girl walking past with a loaf of French bread and a sack of tangerines, but I couldn't be sure it was her. I couldn't remember if I'd ever seen her face. I slept long nights on the pilled mattress of the Murphy bed. Dad's leg glowered from its pedestal. A wooden table with one wobbly leg that Dad made Rory and me drag in off the curb. He said the table would hold fine as long as we propped the broken leg with a stack of flattened cigarette cartons. And it did. My dreams were bad and got worse as the summer wore on. The worst dream of all came on the night it happened. The night after the 4th of July. I remember because it was right before the heat wave broke. You remember? The bad one that tripped the grid and blacked out the entire east side? Has it been over a month already? Oh, Christ. <laughs> you lose track. That night was the hottest night I'd seen since the chapel in the jungle. The apartment was stale and suffocating, and the reek of garlic and cigarettes and formaldehyde was everywhere. I felt miserable and feverish. Even after I'd stripped down to my underwear and cranked the knob on the window fan as far as it would go, my stomach gnawed as I lay sleepless, watching red digits on the clock radio in the kitchenette stack minutes into hours. It was a little past three when I heard a crack like a gunshot, a transformer shorting out. 
The fan blade stopped whirring and all the street lamps went dark. I'd never thought about how much light comes in through a person's windows, even with the curtains closed. But, suddenly, the whole apartment was black as pitch. The clock radio clicked into battery mode and its red glow gave shape to the card table, the icebox, and the world's biggest pickled pig's foot. I heard the door to Dad's room creak open, telling me the Transformer had woken him up too, and he would need a couple cigarettes and a spoonful of carnation and maybe half an hour on the toilet listening to his own satisfied grunts to soothe him back to sleep. A sound came from the hall like something catching or dragging on the carpet. I tried to climb out of bed to help, thinking he'd wedged his wheels against the baseboards again. But, as always happens in nightmares, I found myself fixed flat on my back, paralyzed and numb. The dragging sound grew louder and closer. I panicked. Fear swarmed through me and I screamed at my frozen muscles, Get up! Get up, Jesus, get up! But my arms and legs were too heavy or too weak or too tired. My eyes raced to the only scrap of light, the red glow of the clock, and something was wrong. The light was all wrong. It wasn't doing something it usually did. It wasn't casting the right shadow on the linoleum. It wasn't casting the shadow of the leg. The leg was gone. The steel caps were still locked tightly in place, but nothing floated in the yellow preservative except a layer of fallen off bits that formed chunky sediment at the bottom of the tube. The dragging came again, this time right next to the Murphy band. I squeezed my eyes shut, pressing hot tears between my eyelashes, and for the first time in a long time, my lips moved silently in frantic prayer. Slowly, I rolled my eyes to the side of my head, and I saw it. The ghastly, rotten leg. It was coming for me, sliding through the dark, using the rubbery remains of its toes to drag itself across the rough theater lobby carpet. Strings of flesh and the knob of a jellied femur left a trail of preservative to show where it had been. And I could smell it. Not the formaldehyde smell, but the smell from beneath the palmettos. The smell of maggots feasting on raw cheeseburgers. Of flesh rotting in the tropical sun. I felt a tug at the sheets and the exposed knuckle of the leg's big toe appeared above the mattress. I felt myself losing it, delirious with fear. Then came the second toe, struggling over the hump, gripping the sheet like a monkey to pull itself up, up, up onto the mattress. The other toes followed as the leg slithered into bed with me. I gagged on the stench and the fear and the feel of spongy flesh against my belly. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. I was going to drown in fear. I shut my eyes and felt my heart thump out one more massive helping of blood before everything went bright white. And then I was awake. I leapt out of bed and wheeled around, sweeping my eyes to the tube in the corner. It bobbed there, innocently in the red glow, as if to say, See? I've been right here the whole time. The blood rushed from my head and I dropped to my hands and knees, weak. My ribs stood out from my chest as I breathed in and out. My heart skipped and started. I think I might have brayed out for a while. I was so tired. So tired and so hungry and so weak. I looked up at the leg, hating it. I wanted everything back the way it was. I wanted to walk into our old kitchen and find Dad standing on two feet in front of the stove 
flipping a batch of his famous hotcakes and practicing aloud his sermon for the day. I wanted Rory to come back and make me believe I wasn't alone anymore. I wanted to sink my teeth into a hamburger or a banana or a slice of roast beef without feeling my tongue begin to explore its imaginary craters and boils. I wanted to be rid of it. All of it! The tube was easier to break than you'd think. It really only took one good whack with the hot plate to shatter the entire thing. Dad heard the noise, of course, but he must have considered his own obvious limitations because he didn't even try to pull me off. He screamed curses at me from his wheelchair, and when that didn't work, he dialed the number Father Clausen had written next to the phone. Then, you guys came, and brought me here. At first you strapped me to the bed, but I got that privilege back for good behavior. I'm not sure how long it took you guys to arrive after Dad called. I don't really remember that part at all. I expect it probably took longer than usual on account of the blackout. All I remember is a terrible, throbbing urgency to have Dad back. The real Dad. The dad who'd made us pancakes and hated the smell of ashtrays and who stood sweating before a tribe of villagers intent only on the word of God. The dad who'd said in a voice I can now recall only as an echo, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You've been listening to Dad's Famous Preserves, my Saros Nikita. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Horror Hill. Don't forget to tune in again next week, when I yet again regale you with a handful of tales to terrify, plumb from the most depraved depths of the human imagination. Dad's Famous Preserves was written by and brought to you courtesy of Saros Nikita. Saras is a writer of horror and science fiction short stories and novels, many of which are set in the American South. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Check out the link in the show notes for my growing library of audiobooks. If you'd like to hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you support this show, and that means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the horror hill for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener. And whatever you do... If you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and 
a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda, Luke Hodgkinson, and Jesse Cornett. Final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshak. The program's artwork by yours truly, Jason Hill. Logo by Craig Groshak. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights